So welcome everybody to a deep adaptation Q&A uh, today with Satish Kumar. Um, my name's Jem Bendel and I'll be uh, <coughs> chatting with Satish for about half an hour before then inviting your questions to him. Um, I'm honored to be joined by Satish whose book Radical Love came out yesterday and he's probably well known to many of you as an elder in environmental activism uh, and I only actually recently learned uh, that Satish first came to uh, fame for his walk uh, for world peace back in the 60s, all the way from India to the capitals of Moscow, Paris, London, and Washington, DC. Those were the capitals of the nuclear powers at the time. And so it was a walk for world peace with a concern about, about nuclear prolifer proliferation and nuclear war. Um, and obviously after traversing all those landscapes, Satish realized there's no better place to settle in the world than North Devon, uh, not far from my mum, in fact. Uh, and that's where, um, near where he founded the important Schumacher College, uh, which is is world famous in uh, environmental studies. Uh, and he also founded Resurgence magazine. Uh, thankfully, now that Satish is in his 80s, it's a relief that he doesn't have to do that walk again because all the world leaders, uh, leaders of the nuclear powers have become wise and peace loving and there's no <laughs> threat whatsoever of a nuclear holocaust anymore. Um, but I'm digressing. Um, as the book Radical Love is just out, I haven't read it, but I loved the description that it's an exploration of the transformative power of love in all its forms, ranging from romantic love to love of family, community, love of the planet and all beings. So I'm going to really look forward to hearing uh, about Satish's philosophy and how in the face of so much that we love being lost um, and obviously fearing the future loss as well, uh, how one uh, remains open-hearted uh, and retains that loving consciousness and applies it in daily life. So Satish Kumar, welcome. Thank you for joining us. It is my pleasure, uh, Jam, to be uh, in conversation with you. And I have always admired the work of deep adaptation. And therefore, having conversation with you is a great pleasure and honor. Thank you. Thank you, Satish. Yes. Um, it's, it's, it's super to conclude this uh, series of Deep Adaptation Q&As with you, uh, because I think for me, uh, back in 2018, when I shared the Deep Adaptation paper and there was this uh, unexpected response, which was very emotionally charged, people were very affected uh, by it. Um, I didn't know what to suggest people do, but I thought, well, we, whatever it is, let's try and meet in a spirit of compassion, kindness, forgiveness. Uh, uh, and I talked about it, the love in deep adaptation being where we should start from as we try and work out what to do uh, in the difficult years ahead. And so, yeah, I was very attracted by the, the fact that that's the topic of your book. So to get us started, obviously, there's so much we could talk about. Um, but as it's hot off the press, what, is it, what do you mean by love and what do you mean by radical love? Yes, I mean, there are two kinds of love, you can say. One is moderate love, which is you love somebody who is near and dear to you. And there are some conditions. You have to be nice, you have to be friendly, you have to be good. So there are some conditions, but you love your husband, wife, children, parents, maybe friends. Uh, but so that's a moderate love, and and we have that. Not always enough, and uh, not even moderate love is not much in practice, but still there is. But then radical love is love without any expectations. You drop all expectations in return. You don't expect anything. And so it's unconditional. And radical love is even loving person who you may not like. So for example, uh, people like Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King, or people who were fighting against imperialism, colonialism, racism, sexism, all these sort of things. And yet they were embodiment of love. My, I had a great honor and, and a privilege of meeting Martin Luther King. In his uh, 10 years of activism, he was arrested for 29 wow. times. And yet, when I met him, he was sort of oozing with love, kind of 
right? embodiment of love. So that's like I would call radical love that you can stand for your values, for ideals, and, and you can challenge uh, uh, racism, sexism, uh, imperialism, colonialism, uh, industrialism, modernity, all these things you can challenge. And yet you have no hatred in your heart. That I call that total acceptance of reality as it is, and then participating in the process of transformation with bigger picture, with magnanimous, magnanimous mind, a big kind mind, and you act. So that's what I call radical love. So that's great to hear, the love without expectation. And of course that could apply at the interpersonal level, but also uh, in terms of how we relate uh, to society or how we relate to uh, the natural world. I'm just thinking a love without expectation in, in terms of the natural world, that means that you, you love all beings and you're not expecting that to mean that uh, Mother Earth is stays friendly to Homo sapiens. <laughs> you're not. You're not. You're not thinking. I'm doing this because then we fix things. Uh, we'll fix. But the, the thing yeah. is about Mother Earth and nature and environment is that love is a kind of based on the principle of reciprocity. Mm. Now, if you give Mother Earth your love, you get love back. If you harm, hurt, damage, injure your Mother Earth, then Mother Earth comes back with climate change or pollution or waste or, or that, and that will harm you. So without reciprocity, so love is un, without expectations, but at the same time, it's a reciprocal. Uh -huh. So if you have a, a love for Mother Earth, you don't damage the Earth, you don't pollute the Earth, you don't waste anything, you don't um, create global warming, uh, carbon emission, et cetera, then it's a love. But if you so, are, yes. So I'm just thinking then, so is the ecological crisis a crisis of a lack of love? Exactly. Crisis of ecological crisis, environmental crisis, climate change, global warming, these are because we have looked at nature as if it is um, a, a kind of um, uh, inanimate object. Mm. And nature is a kind of resource for our use and our economy and our production, our consumption and our materialism, all those things. So we are using nature without loving, just exploiting. Radical love will be that nature is not inanimate object but it is a living organism. And you treat nature as you treat your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your wife, your husband, your children, your neighbors, and so on. Mm -hmm. So trees are our neighbors and animals are our neighbors. And we have to love them as we love our neighbors. So the reason we have climate change and global warming is because of lack of love. Mm. So why do you think that lack of love has become so widespread systematic intense because we all have that ability to love nature love all beings but uh, the systems we live in the way we live doesn't seem to look like we're loving uh planet earth why, why has that it's, happened yeah it, it's a good question and uh, it, there can be many opinions and many views about why that happened, how that happened, when that happened. All these are very big uh, questions and there can be different opinions. But in my view, people who preached love, relig religions, Catholic, Protestant, Hindus, Muslims, whatever the religions are, who preached love, they did not practice love. They just talked about it, but they became very dogmatic, and very ritualistic and, 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 and a kind of, you can say, domineering without reason, without understanding. And so there was a great reaction against religious dogmas. And therefore people like René Descartes and so on, uh, they became very rationalist. And from that pure reason and pure rationalism and, and a mind and matter separate and nature and human separate. And so how uh, we can be away from this uh, idea of love, which is more religious uh, idea and, and, uh, and the dualistic Cartesian sort of uh, philosophy became very popular. 
And, and people felt that they are going to be liberated and free from this dogma of religion. And therefore, uh, all our universities and schools and educational system, they have been pushing this pure intellectual and academic and reason, rationality is the, the controlling factor and heart and, and consciousness and the soul and the spirit and the love, they became kind of sideshow or not at all important. So education and all over the world now, the education is conditioning people's mind. The only thing what matters is a rational, intellectual, academic and a reason, a science um, and, and modernity and then industrialism and then kind of uh, all these things followed. So that's how it happened. And why we took it over? Because we thought well, they're comfortable. We can use nature for our comfort, this economic growth and living standards and, and more material possessions. So that's a kind of looks very kind of comfortable. And so greed was promoted instead of love. Yeah, it's interesting how you describe the the yeah, the way that people rebelled against religions because they became so ritualistic and lost the heart, the spirituality, the love but then created these, what seemed to be empowering uh, alternatives with rationality, the enlightenment and so on. But then they, they became so uh, heartless. So yeah, we can read papers on climate science, which clearly if, <laughs> if the people who've done the work and written the papers are like you and me, then it hurts to be studying what they're studying. Uh, exasperating, painful. There's lots of grief involved and a lot of fear, um, but we're not allowed to communicate that. That's not seen as uh, scientific uh, or scholarly. Um, and yeah. I know there's quite a few climatologists now. That's why they've started to communicate in new ways yeah, and yeah, become yeah, activists yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now the thing is that the people like Joanna Macy, uh, who you interviewed, and and the people like her, and uh, and also uh, others. Uh, they have said that we must be allowed to feel our grief mm. for planet Earth and, and feel our kind of sorrow and, and anxiety. But of course, they also, uh, Joanna Macy in particular, have said that we also need to empower ourselves with other emotions of compassion and love so that we are not all the time stuck um, in our grief and our anxiety. So yes. eco grief, eco anxiety are natural, and I'm very pained, and my heart bleeds, and my I, I sometimes I'm in tears to see uh, what we are doing to our planet Earth, or what we are doing to our humanity, what we are doing to people in Ukraine. Hundreds of thousands of people are becoming refugees for no reason, for no purpose, just a, a kind of ego, um, uh, ego, uh, a collective ego of one nation or the other nation, and two egos are clashing against each other. So there are many, many examples of that kind where we are um, uh, not able to uh, to live in harmony with our friends and neighbors and nature. And so that uh, anxiety and grief should lead to empowerment and that empowerment should lead to action mm. and that action can transform our society. Yeah, I've, I've been on a bit of a journey because I, uh, growing up as a British guy and uh, then becoming an academic, um, I think I was, uh, had some of an awkward relationship with my emotions and uh, and I thought that certain emotions, fear, anxiety, anger, sadness, all these, all these things were things that uh, were not good to feel in various different ways, like sadness would be debilitating or uh, fear meant you weren't tough enough or uh, anger meant that you weren't civilized enough or, or you might hurt someone. And what I've come to now is, is to, it's okay. Those emotions, when they're there, to notice them, to not feel bad about them, not fear them. I also find it helpful to be able to express them privately sometimes with some people, but then to not decide from them and not to act from them. And actually always try and think, well, why am I hurting or why am I angry? And, and then try and get that uh, broader perspective and always also remind myself that something else is true. Something else that's good is also true. To whatever it is I'm stressing over 
And yes, then, yes. And then I, that's then how I then think about what to do next. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is that we are humans. And so as humans, we have many, many different kinds of emotions. Mm. And the fear and anxiety are there and, and they are natural. But at the same time, we also have emotions of compassion, of kindness, of generosity, of love, of many other um, emotions we have. But those emotions are also suppressed in our modern world. And we are not um, expected to express our love and our, our compassion and kindness. We are supposed to be greedy and, and, and successful and want something more for ourselves and more name, fame, power, prestige, and position, status, money, houses, cars, possessions. We, we are encouraged to do that rather than celebrate our emotions of every kind and live uh, in balance uh, and then live in harmony with nature. That's not encouraged. So this human ego, we have to move from collective ego to eco, which is a more home, more uh, relationship. So we have lost the idea of relationship and we have got this idea of separation. So I'm separate from nature, humanity is separate from nature and the Europeans are separate from, uh, from Africans and, and Chinese are separate from Americans and Russians are separate from Ukrainians. The idea of separation rules the world and, oh. and, and, and out of that separation, we are creating, trying to create a uniformity. So modernity, industrialism, uh, market economy, uh, all these ideas are to create a uniform world. A whole world should be like Europe and America. Everywhere McDonald's, everywhere Coca-Cola, everywhere high-rise buildings. This kind of uniformity and a monoculture, uh, imposition of that. And if you don't follow like our way, you are not democratic. You are not free. If you don't follow our way, then you are not um, among with us or, or one of us. So that kind of separation is the dominant um, uh, philosophy. And love is a philosophy of relationship that we are all interconnected, we are all interrelated, we are one humanity, we are one planet Earth, we, the whole cosmos is our country, whole planet is our home, nature is our nationality, love is our religion, that unity of life, interconnectedness, interdependence, those are the values of love, whereas uh, values of hatred and separation and a division and conflict are becoming dominant. And this is why my book is challenging that um, separation. So when I hear you, I, I, I'm still scared of the idea that rather than publicly lamenting and worrying about the collapse of modern societies, industrial consumer societies, actually it's about time. <laughs> like this, this drive, what we call progress, perhaps rather stupidly, what we call modernity, perhaps rather stupidly, is a drive towards separation and and uh, and 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 it's yeah disconnection it, and, and disconnection, and therefore there's the possibility of um, a breaking up of what we consider normal, particularly those of us who live sort of uh, consumer lifestyles, um, is also an invitation into a different way of thinking and being. Um, yes. You mentioned the word progress. You mentioned the word progress. Progress is a linear word. Development is a linear word. Growth is a linear word. Nature is not linear. Nature has no progress. Nature has no development. Nature has no um, growth. Nature is cyclical. What is born will live, thrive, blossom and then fruit, and then die. So birth, death, coming, going, it moves in a cyclical way. Systemic, systemic uh, nature is this circular and, and a kind of, uh, a kind of um, not linear, not progress, not development, not growth. Go, go, go. I mean, America is number one economy in the world, and yet they have not enough growth and progress and development. They want more economic growth. Britain is a fifth or sixth economy in the world, and yet they want more growth. There's no end to it, it's very linear. So nature is not linear. So what we have to do is to, to learn from nature. Nature is our teacher, nature is our mentor, nature is our spiritual guide. 
and we learn from nature to live more cyclical. Something is born, something will thrive, something will flourish, and that will die. And mm. then born again, start so, again. So the cyclical approach has to be part of a radical love. So for you, Satish, this, this is wisdom that you grew up in. Uh, you're, you're, uh, I believe Jainism is, is your sort of cultural heritage and you grew up in India and this cyclical view of life and with all the work you've been doing, you've been communicating this philosophy now for so long. Yeah. And the news Absolutely. is so bad. Yeah. Or what, what's the, what is it about you that there seems to be a sense of deep down, it's still all okay. No matter, no matter how much silliness and, and, and abuse through this linear, uh, unloving, separative, disconnected uh, hallucination that humanity is stuck with, you still have this inner joy. I have about, inner joy yeah, what's because that? at Where the same time, from? I have inner joy, but because at the same time as our planet is being kind of messed about and, and being polluted and 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 almost sort of being destroyed at the same time nature is resilience and and it's still we get rain and we get sunshine and we get um, seeds put in the soil and the soil produces food and and the trees produce fruit <laughs> and birds are still singing uh, uh, to celebrate nature mm -hmm. and there are many many humans also creating beauty art, craft, poetry, music. <clears throat> so there are these positive aspects which gives me joy. So I just don't look only on the negative side. We also look on the positive side to balance the thing. But what we need to do in order to, to practice radical love, all of us, whether you are a politician or a business leader or an economist or, or a factory worker or a farmer, all of us need to take the Hippocratic oath. Like the doctors take Hippocratic oath. We all need to take, and that is a oath of loyalty to nature, loyalty to um, environment, loyalty to our planet Earth, and loyalty to humans. So do no harm. That is the Hippocratic oath. Do first do no harm. At the moment, we are doing harm to nature, harm to uh, many millions of people are suffering uh, because of exploitation, social injustice, and we are doing harm to ourselves because there's so much ill health in the world. And you cannot have healthy people on a sick planet. This is the truth of it. And therefore, we if we take Hippocratic oath and say we'll do no harm. That is a kind of Jain Indian uh, tradition that I was brought up. Non-violence yes. is the fundamental principle um, of nature. And we feed each other, we nourish each other. Soil feeds, rain feeds, sun feeds, uh, trees feed. We all feed each other. Life feeds life. That's a cyclical nature of nature. And so unless we understand that um, and, and live in that reciprocal, systemic, cyclical way, uh, I don't think this continuous linear economic growth is going to make us any happy. Yes, um, we've, we've, as you mentioned your book there, have you, have you shown us it yet to show that it's already out now, it exists Yes, I did show, show it, did. it's okay, here good. on my, my desk and yeah. it's out and, and you can order it uh, through, I mean, I edit, or I'm editor emeritus now of Resurgence uh -huh. magazine. And you can order that book through resurgence.org. Um, uh, we, we sell directly. But also, I mean, I don't like Amazon, so I don't encourage people to order on Amazon. But if yeah. you have a local bookshop, then you can order through your bookshop. Have a patience to wait for a few days is better than supporting Amazon. Amazon is dreadful. And so, uh, so uh, I would encourage you to either order through resurgence or through your local bookshop. And if you do it now, it might arrive by Valentine's Day. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so as we're talking books, I mean, I was very happy you uh, wrote an endorsement and also read the Deep Adaptation uh, book that I co-edited with, with Rupert Reed. So you're aware of the ethos, the uh, taking the anticipation of collapse of modern society seriously and still within that framework, wanting to uh, find ways of doing useful, positive things in the world. Um, yes. And so what, when you read that, 
and the 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 framework of asking four questions of you know yeah. what 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 do we want to keep what do we want to what should we give up what can we bring back what do we have to make peace with you know no, i hours. think your deep adaptation is a kind of precautionary principle even if you don't believe uh, in what is happening in the world and what you are analyzing and i'm analyzing even if some people don't believe it still the remedies you have suggested in your uh, in your article which perhaps you can explain uh, better than i can do called resilience and and a kind of uh, all those four principles uh, that you have that they are good whatever the situation they are good principles so i uh, admire and support deep adaptation because of those four principles which you have stated and perhaps you can explain those four principles are so good that if we live by them that to me is a kind of foundation of radical love can you tell those four principles yeah sure so the um well the really it was a i i I offered a framework for conversation because I thought the 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 breaking of societies as we experience them today is going to be uh, affecting everyone in a different way. So rather than me saying what you should do, it was how do we start to talk about this? And I yeah. imagined it as a framework which was post progress. It was beyond that. So none of the questions were about what do we need to invent. Uh, in order to fix going forward, they were deliberately conversations which were about well, what, what what do we have now that we believe in and value that we wish to keep? What's most important? Um, what is it that we should relinquish? Relinquish more well, to let go. Otherwise, if we try and hold on to that aspect yeah. of our standard of living or identity or worldview, will actually make matters worse. Um, so that was resilience and relinquishment. The third one was, well, we didn't used to live like this. You know, <laughs> so uh, what what is what are the ways of living and producing and consuming of the past that actually we need to bring back to help us through this rather disruptive future we're we're facing? And then, that's a restoration. Uh, yeah, yeah restoration. That's, uh, restoration. Yeah, and then yeah. reconciliation was to retain the idea that um, things don't look very good at all uh, mm. going forward in terms of uh, food, energy, climate, biosphere. And so there may be increasing real difficult uh, situations for people. And so that is a reminder of our mortality. Uh, yeah. And therefore, so as we recognize our mortality, um, what do we, what or who do we want to make peace with? And then yeah. that was, that was because I think, yeah, a lot of people wanted to, to get busy on deep adaptation in a way where we could, somehow park our fears about death and yeah. i wanted to say well, well no like this is, if you're going to work on this then 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 loss and death and, and grief is going to be a companion for the rest of your life more explicitly and yeah. so what can that invite us to do well <laughs> make peace in in many different ways with many different people yeah. and with, yeah. uh, with, with things those four hours yes those four hours that you have presented I think are kind of uh, based in wisdom. Th those, I, I think they are very important, whether climate change or no climate change or whatever, those perennial wisdom uh, is the kind of relevant and, and a useful and helpful to everybody, any situation. At the moment, our society is living on kind of principles of waste and pollution and, and greed and all those things and, and causing climate change and, and, and the climate catastrophe and then resulting in floods and uh, forest fires and all that. So we are living in very difficult circumstances. So those four R's should be made popular and, and available to everybody so we can practice them. Okay, thank you for saying that. That's very, very, very positive feedback. And I'm sure also all the people on this call who are part of the Deep Adaptation Forum or the deep adaptation movement more generally uh, can relate to what you're saying because uh, I think what people get from being in these uh, in this network is is a framework for having conversations which help them uh, think what to do in their own lives and also professionally yeah. and in their community. I'm going to yeah. go to questions now. So, uh, so hello. Hi there. Hello, Hi, Good Satish. to see you. Long Your time question, now. Is Satish. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, I don't think I've actually spoken to you in the flesh for about 40, 50 years. But um, um, anyway, my, my, my main question is radical love sounds wonderfully aspirational. And I'm asking how can we make, acknowledge the meaningfulness of the current crisis in the bigger picture? So many extinction events have happened before and life has always come back more diverse afterwards so that the, the, the cyclical nature of what you talk about includes the acceptance that we may be dying not as a planet but as a species and that if that is so and we don't manage to stop it life the planet will be all right the life will come back as zach bush so often reminds us more diverse next yes, time yes. Yes. we don't worry about time yeah no, I, I, you, are, you have a good point. I, I think it's a very good point that uh, the cycle of extinction continues is a kind of part of birth and death. So my personal feeling is that what we are going to see will be the end of this industrial, modern, mechanistic uh, civilization. Uh, but soil and land is not going to stop producing food yeah and the and the the rain is not going to stop bringing water and the sun is not going to stop um, creating um, photosynthesis synthesis and and the trees are not going to stop producing food and taking our carbon and giving us oxygen so nature and humans still will live in my view what will come to an end which cannot be sustained anyway is this very um, kind of mechanistic and heavily dependent on energy, uh, how kind of energy you even renewable energy, if we are too much dependent on endless growth and endless energy, how much energy can you get from sun and the wind? And if our greed does not um, stop and, and, and we don't stop our as a cyclical nature and, and don't stop our stop linear progress. So my view is that if the industrial system, materialistic, mechanistic system come to an end, we will celebrate that. We will celebrate that and we will say uh, humanity will adapt and adopt a new way of li li life, which is more simple, more elegant, uh, more caring and more sharing. But of course, there is no utopia. We, we are not going to be utopia. We will always have fear, anger, anxiety, some conflict, some uh, some problems in our uh, our lives and on our planet. Never, I, I don't believe in kind of that we can have uh, uh, everything perfect. Uh, so, but in that situation, nature will still give life and humanity can learn to live in harmony with nature. That's my hope. And I'm working in that sort of way that let us, let's re-examine our relationship with nature and, and, and live better. So Satish, you... within the recent, my perception of modern environmentalism is that that is not such a welcome view anymore. Uh, there's an emphasis on technology and entrepreneurship and strong leadership somehow uh, uh, fixing the problems. Uh, and there's some dismissal of the kind of views you've expressed as uh, naive. Uh, and when you hear those criticisms, uh, or even some people would say those views are privileged, such as, like, it's nice to have those ideas, but in the real world, we need all kinds of technological innovations just to keep people fed and watered. Yes. And we just need to keep you people away from who... nature, which we will rewild. And in that sort of, again, in that sense of separation, how, how do you respond to those criticisms? Yes, yes. I mean, I, those who talk about the real world, and realism and call me utopian or idealistic, I ask them, you have been creating the real world for centuries or hundreds of years. You have been realist and, and people like me are idealistic and utopian. But look what you have achieved. What have you there to show us for your realism? Is Ukraine war a result of realism? Is climate change? Uh, uh, not um, a result of realism? 
uh, is um, is the poverty and, and and exploitation of humanity going on in Africa and many other countries, even in America, the homeless and poor and beggars. Is that the result, not a result of realism? So realism has failed, totally and utterly failed. So, so I would say, give idealism a chance. Give okay. this kind of utopian idea a chance and see if love can help. Hatred has been practiced by the realists. And realists have failed the humanity. So I challenge the real, the so-called real world and realism. And, and I say people who have uh, made better impression on the world, Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King and, 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 and Simone de Beauvoir and many other people who have been a bit more idealistic yes. and ecological and, and so yeah. on. They are they have something, they are too realists. So I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be an eco-modernist arguing with with you there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I wouldn't wouldn't mind seeing some uh, someone some discuss with you on that. Sue, Susan, if you have anything to add, otherwise we'll move to uh, Christine. Thank you. Yeah, I just Satish, have you changed your thinking and your philosophy one iota Katarina, since, since we were um, building huts with um, and digging wells with the tribal people in the International School of Nonviolence, and they stole from us? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, the thing is that, th thank you, Susan, that uh, um, one is always evolving. And, and I was not thinking in, the, in terms of radical love at that time. But still, uh, the influences of those uh, cultural values, and particularly indigenous wisdom, uh, which is a kind of perennial wisdom, is still with me. Although I am changing, I'm evolving, I'm not just stuck with any any particular uh, situation. Um, so it's a both. I, I still carry some continuation of uh, cultural values, but I'm also evolving and learning new ideas. Thank you, and thank you, okay. Sue. So uh, now we're gonna go to Katerina with your question for Satish. Hi everyone, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Satish. Uh, hello from Portugal today. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief. Satish, would you say that uh, the crushing, the deliberate crushing of the feminine values from, from society, but also from religion, has maybe contributed seriously to <coughs> this massive loss of, of love and compassion and, and connection to nature? And if yes. so, would you agree that by elevating feminine values, that, that elevating feminine values should be a priority in everyone so that we can be a bit more connected to each other and to nature. Yes, yes. You're absolutely right um, that we need to embrace uh, feminine values. And uh, in, our, in India, we say that uh, in our men and women in our body, we are embodiment of both receiving and giving. And, and receiving is feminine, and 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 article giving is is so, so supposed to be um, masculine. So, for example, I'm speaking to you now, and listening. Now, listening, we have two ears, so we need, and the ears are feminine, and mouth is masculine. I, I kind of metaphorically speaking, um, so we need to listen twice, meaning feminine two part and masculine one part, like water is made of H2O. Human should be F2, F2M, two part feminine, one part masculine, mm -hmm. F2M. So hear more, listen more, and that's a two part. So feminine principles of caring, sharing, loving, radical love, um, looking after each other, that's a very important uh, two part. And then of course, um, we do sort of things which are a bit more masculine, much kind of uh, sort of um, outgoing uh, and so on. But that's also part of it. So it's a balance of the two, a dance between the masculine and feminine is needed. What has happened in our culture, in industrial culture is very mechanistic and also very masculine. 
And therefore, we have valued masculine principles uh, of uh, controlling, organizing, etc., much more administration and so on. And we have lost the feminine principles in our culture. And so the balance has been lost. So if you take Chinese principle of yin yang, yin yang are in balance with each other. And that the black had a white dot in it and the white had a black dot in it. So that dance between masculine and feminine and a balance together, that is a kind of traditional Chinese idea. Same with the Indian idea. And, but we have lost in this modern industrial mechanistic worldview, we have lost that balance and we have promoted more masculine controlling, going out, mining, um, uh, exploring, uh, exploiting nature. That's all very masculine. That has gone too far. So I need, we need to retreat a little bit in our masculine uh, adventures and more caring and more taking uh, uh, relationship and all that needs to be promoted. So two part feminine, one part masculine. F2M. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, and thank you, Katerina. Yeah, I I realize that that although patriarchal monotheisms don't seem to have a place for the divine feminine uh, as much as, say, for example, Hinduism, obviously uh, patriarchal culture also exists uh, in within Hindu cultures, and so it does seem to be something which um, is a is a, a widespread problem. And, um, it's a widespread and, problem, but if you take Hindu culture, hmm. all the names of gods and gods and goddesses, we have a, thousands of goddesses, yes. and all the names of gods start with goddess first. So Sita, Ram, Radha, Krishna, they are feminine oh, wow. first. And so the goddess and, and the kind of Gaya, the earth of Gaya, also a Sanskrit word, Gaya tree mantra, is mm -hmm. a, a mantra of the goddess, Gaya tree. Tree is the goddess and Gaya. So Gaia in Greek, Gaia in Sanskrit. So that's a very strong culture in India. But also like in the West, everywhere uh, in India too, uh, we have been influenced by this mech mechanistic and masculine um, kind of adventure. And we have lost our own culture and values. And now India is going kind of in a berserk way to oh. industrialization and mechanization and, and a kind of uh, exploitation of nature uh, in a no less than Europe and America. So I'm not admiring what is happening in India now, but I'm saying that you go into the roots of Indian philosophy in which I was brought up in Jain and Hindu and Mahatma Gandhi, Vinoba Bhave, the land gift movement, all those things had a, a very important and a strong place for the feminine. Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, Because of where I live, I, I know quite a lot of um, people who are locally Hindu here in Bali, but also a lot of foreign people who've chosen uh, Hinduism uh, and also some people who've chosen shamanism. And there is a much, so, so a reverence for the natural world is, is um, it's pretty obvious and straightforward for, for yeah. them. Uh, and, and yeah, absolutely. So um, thank you. We're going to go to uh, now um, uh, a question, please, from Sukema. I'm, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. After all this talk, I'm just trying to remember what my question is. <laughs> it's to do with um, suicide. To what extent are we human beings on a path towards collective suicide? Perhaps unconsciously, we realize that us homo sapiens uh, are really had enough. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, maybe maybe it's time for us to go and allow the rest of all other sentient beings to recover and flourish again. I know that seems like a little bit of a pessimistic view, but it's yeah. certainly a view that is around for me, uh, being a, a sense of the, the lemming nature of us uh, as we keep on pushing. There won't be much air to breathe soon. There won't be much water to drink. Yeah, uh, it's absolutely. It's a, it's a point I often hear, which is that maybe the time of Homo sapiens is up. Uh, and then uh, that often leads to a very interesting conversation. I'd love to hear your response, Satish. Yes, no, I'm, I respect your view, uh, and, and there's no one view which is one truth that prevails everywhere. 
But my personal view is I'm more a, an optimist uh, because I'm an activist and I want to, uh, and I have an active hope. Uh, so uh, Joanna Macy has written a book called Active Hope and, and Jane Goodall and two great feminine uh, kind of um, heroes of mine. And, and, John, uh, and uh, Jane Goodall has written a book called Book of Hope. So I am an optimist and I have an active hope because I say that never too late, never too late, when you are at the brink of uh, disaster, when you are at the kind of cliff, uh, cliff edge, still you can return, take a step back. So I'm an activist. And, and if you are a pessimist, you cannot be an activist. And I've been an activist since I was 18 years old. And I'm 85 now. And I want to remain an activist until the last breath of my life. So I don't want to give up. I say, yes, we, humanity is not bad. There are many, many small farmers who produce good food. There are many, many craftsmen and women who produce artisan materials. There are many, many indigenous people who live in a harmony with nature. It's not just uh, America and Europe and, and, and so on that they are the only world. There is another world which gives me hope. The indigenous people in Brazil and in, 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 um, in uh, Aboriginal people in Australia, and we have to honor them. So I am an optimist. If you are a pessimist, you might become a journalist, but not an activist. To be an activist, you have to be a, an optimist. So the Joanna, read Joanna Macy's Active Hope, read uh, uh, Jane Goodall's Book of Hope, and be an active to the last breath of my life. I will try to do my best. And then what happens is not in my control. It's not in my hand. I'm not predicting that, um, that humanity is doomed. I'm not predicting uh, Earth is doomed. I'm not in control of the world, but I'm in control of my action and my thinking. And I want to remain active to do whatever I can do in the service of our precious planet Earth and uh -huh. the service of humanity. I'm an activist. I'm an optimist. But I okay. honor and respect your view. I'm not saying that you are wrong. I'm not saying that. But this is my view. Satish, what, what you're saying reminds me of how we started when you talk about love, uh, a radical love that doesn't have expectations. So you, you don't need to know that uh, Homo sapiens will live for millions of years in order for you to passionately do your best to, to, exactly. to help exactly. uh, all exactly. flourishing, flourishing of all life on Earth, including Homo sapiens. So there's that. And that relates to your philosophy. In, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Is it apigraha, the non grasping? You don't you don't yes, need yes. because it's, yes. you're just living from love. So you're not you're not you're not needing to know that it will all. Now, fix this anything. is a very beautiful word, aparigraha, which I mm -hmm. think you have pronounced correctly. Aparigraha. Mm -hmm. A means no. Parigraha. Graha means grasping. Parigraha very strongly grasping, very kind of tightly grasping. So aparigraha, the three words made into one word. And this is one of the five cardinal principles of Jain tradition. Non-violence, truth, um, uh, non-stealing, and a kind of uh, right relationship, and not grasping or not being grasped by your material possessions and, and your greed and, and your uh, ego and desires to have more and more and more. So elegant, simple, the, another, another my book is called Elegant Simplicity. So Aparigraha is the principle that have enough, but not more than enough. Have what is beautiful, not ugly. At the moment, our civilization is creating a lot of ugliness. Aparigraha promotes beauty and Aparigraha uh, promotes restraint because if you have a flowing river, river can flow freely only within the two banks. So those two banks are Aparigraha. They hold the water together without limit, without restraint, without constraint. If you have total freedom, like this material economic growth and modern society has a total freedom, no restraint, no limit, that disaster, that's a flood. Yeah. A river without banks becomes a flood and it creates problems. So the aparigraha is that principle of beauty, elegance, simplicity, living within your means and celebrating what you have rather than greedy for what you do not have. And then going for something non-material things such as poetry, uh -huh. music, art, culture, dancing, walking, family, friendship. There are lots of good things which and you so can have 
in Aparigraha. What, what you've described there is a beautiful right way of being and living, uh, which uh, would not have led us to this catastrophic situation, uh, but is also important to do uh, no matter what it adds up to in the end. It's just uh, good in of itself. I just want to come to this issue of, um, so quite a lot of people in the so-called doom sphere uh, talk about human extinction or even inevitable and near-term human extinction. And for me, um, that can be said in a way which is inviting open-heartedness and staying loving, or it can be said in a way which is about becoming numb and turning our back on suffering and possibility. So, um, so some people who think, wow, it looks like humanity might be going extinct, that inspires them to be more loving more truth seeking, uh, more com uh, and, and live in their power. Other people say it as a way of, why should I even bother showing up at a meeting like this? Who cares? We're all gonna die anyway. I'm just gonna go and have fun in some other more superficial way than this yeah, uh, so, super fun so conversation. So in a way, what, so, what you yeah. are saying is a crisis is also an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if we, if there's an extinction, a possible extinction looming out there, then we, we take that opportunity to love more, to care for more. Those four R's that you presented, those four R's are a kind of positive action. Uh, so you can build those four R's and be more loving, more caring. And as I said, have no expectation. We don't know. We are not the prophets of the world. We don't know for sure. But precaution principle that if we go on this, way as we are it's bound to bring extinction bound to bring an end to uh, everything what we have and therefore let us change our way uh, and 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 even if we are going to extinct love each other and and have celebration and joy at the same time so I, mean, I think using that crisis and opportunity is a good thing I think I can't remember now it keeps going up but there are at least 14 homonyms or hominids that didn't evolve into us so I guess if we if we value big brained um, bipedal uh, apes like ourselves, then in a few million years, there'll be those things again, even if we disappear. So <laughs> it's, it seems to be a tendency. The world people's yeah. people, doesn't it, uh, over, yeah. over millennia. Uh, we're yeah. going to have our last question from Myri. Uh, again, I uh, hope I pronounced your name right. Please uh, unmute and uh, I'll ask your question to Satish. Thanks, Jim. It's Mary. Um, hi, Satish. Yeah, I'm hi, interested in very similar ideas. I'm, I talk about radical self-care and I'm wondering um, and where I'm thinking about um, learning to really take care of ourself in the context of the larger self, because the two are the same thing. And so my question is about the need for us to learn to love ourselves first because this industrialized system that we live inside is, creates and contributes to our mental and physical ill health. And in understanding how to recover, you know, we begin with ourselves, and that also then teaches us about living in a different way. So that's you know, a very good self. last question. That is a very good last question. And I think loving yourself is the first step to love the world, because we are the world. World, everybody is in us. We are, we are made of each other. And so I see the whole universe in me and myself in the whole universe. Like William Blake said, that you see the universe in a grain of sand. And so William Blake had a kind of same idea uh, that we need to see our we, that we are a microcosm of macrocosm. So if we love the world, we have to love ourselves. If you don't feed yourself, if you don't take care of yourself, how are you going to love somebody else? So, and if you don't love yourself, who is going to love you? So uh, being a lover is to love yourself and being a lover is to love others. So, uh, so being a lover rather than having a lover, that's a, another Eric Fromm has talked about it, difference between being and having. So rather than having a lover, radical love is to being a lover. And, and a being a lover starts with yourself. Love yourself as you love your neighbor. Love yourself as you love anyone. And, and there's no enemy. There are no enemies. There are no, 
we have just created this in our mind that Putin is my enemy or um, black people are my enemy or white people are my enemy or somebody else is my enemy. There are systems which are which are causing many, many problems of industrialism, materialism, uh, statism, uh, so all these isms. So let all isms become wasms. And, and love, love is not ism. Love is a freedom and liberating force. So starting to love yourself is the first step. And you are microcosm of macrocosm. Love yourself. That's absolutely good way to end this session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Satish. I'm just thinking also though, Mari, you work on this, so if, if, if we only have a minute, but if you wanted to uh, add any reflections, I like to keep this, like, you know, get some reflections back, if you have anything to share. Yeah, it's just an area that I've been thinking about and exploring for a few years and try to write about, and that exactly what Satish is saying, that we are the microcosm of the macro, and, you know, really at a totally physical level, you know, we are full of bacteria and fungi as the world is. So I think about us as being just as each of those things and the human cells are all, they're all these individual cells make up the whole of a human body and mind and spirit. So too, we are a cell in the body of the earth. And so we have something to contribute, something to offer, um, but we have to be well, you know, and the more well yes. we are, happier and healthier, then we can do that because we naturally want to. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you very much, Satish. Um, and uh, do, um, yeah, I hope I hope this has been great, uh, a great warm up for you and Russell later today. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, if anyone wants to order your book, it's resurgence.org, I think is the best link. Also, if anyone wants to uh, share a video recording of this conversation, then I'll put it uh, tomorrow on jembendel.com. And if you want to continue to have these kinds of conversations and don't already, uh, connect with people who want to approach the difficult predicament we're in in this kind of way, I recommend the Deep Adaptation Forum. You can discover more about that through deepadaptation.info. And if you just want to dip your toe in, then you can just go and check out the Deep Adaptation Facebook group and see the kind of things that people talk about. So Satish and everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you, uh, Jem and Stuart, for organizing and coordinating this wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you.